I was born in 1934 and uh, I was adopted from an orphanage and eventually I come to grow up in Greenhides which is on the banks of the London River and all around me in those days of course was lots of sailing barges Blue Circle had many uh, Goldsmiths had still had some of theirs, huge fleet, and uh, Everards, of course, who were actual ship owners in the village. They had barges and steamships and motor ships, and of course, Testers uh, brothers. They repaired barges. We also had the training ships. We had the Worcester which they trained the boys on. Was that a barge, the Worcester? No, no. Big, big old wooden wall. Mm. And eventually we, we had the... Uh, um, once you've, once you've finished her days, we had a steel look-alike come over, called the X, the Exmouth, and they renamed her Worcester. Mm -hmm. But we also had Cutty Sark. She'd been brought round from Falmouth in 1934, and of course, as you know, she's still, she's now up at Greenwich. She was down in Rochester, was she? Or, or no, she, no, no, never came down to never Rochester. Never came to Rochester, the cut his side. What was the first barge that, when you started as a lad? Well, the, the, the many barges were, as I say, were out. Everard's had quite a lot of barges. Uh, they had Cambria, of course, wooden barge, built in 1906. And she went on, of course, to become the last cargo carrying barge with no sails. Never had it, never had an engine fitted. And she was a big coasting barge. She would go right up the up the east coast, fetching coal and all the various other cargoes, or take vice versa, take wheat, corn, barley, up to right up to Cantley, read them on, on to Norwich. Did you on the Cambria? Yes. Tony? But my first sailing barge, of course, when I when I was still growing up, was Greenhive. I got to know Bob Roberts very well. He was skipper of Greenhive. She'd been built in about 1923. She was steel built barge, but on the same lines as the big four the Alf, the Fred, the Ethel and the Will, all named after family members of the Everards. Mm -hmm. And they were built by fellows of Great Yarmouth between 1925 and 1926. Well, fellows were one of the big barge builders yes, were they? They were. up at, in Norfolk. Yes. Uh, growing up, um, we were pretty poor in those days, of course. There was no cars. Uh, the only people that had cars was Everard, who went to Leadenhall Street every day with their chauffeur and their own Rolls Royce and people like that. I can remember to this day. And where was that? Green Heights. In Green Heights, yeah. In the village. And how old were you then? Um, I was growing up. Yeah, was, teenager. No, 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 long before that. Uh, I, can, I was growing up and uh, learnt to swim, of course, but we got thrown in, all of us were thrown into the river at time, various times and pretty filthy dirty in those days. Lots of flotsam and jetsam and now and again when you could learn to swim you'd be pushing the muck aside and you might see a stiffy staring at you. <laughs> and uh, I must have seen about six while I was growing up. They'd either miss their footing going back on board ship and gone in the into the ogin as we called it, or maybe even jumped off bridges or somewhere and committed suicide. And they seemed to get washed into that to that to area there by the White Hart Causeway. The other thing was, of course, um, the White Hart Causeway, which was a pub, still there, but it's now called the John Franklin. 
but it had a that's a in green house. Yeah, it had a wooden causeway running down to the river, and of course the tide ebbed and flowed, and the barge crews would scull the boats ashore to either go into the pubs. And we had four pubs in the village. Would you believe it? And uh, or would go along to the office to get their orders for their next yeah. for their next freight. <coughs> and the barges were moored up in the yeah. river. Barges were made yeah. moored off, and uh, we was it was always the same. Can we look after your boat, Mister? And uh, once they knew you could scull a boat with one oar over the stern, they would allow you to take their boats away. And uh, when when they came down the causeway and called out to you, you'd bring their dinghy back I see to you. them. And uh, anyway, I am very lucky I, because, uh, I, as I say, I knew lots of skippers. I knew Jimmy Uglo very well, he was a very well-known skipper. I knew Henry Miller, I knew Jack Nunn, uh, many of the, of the well-known skippers barge skippers, Knocker Hart was another one and uh, these, were, I, these were skippers that were quite yeah, successful I, in the matches. I think also I think a boy that was showing interest in a barge was uh, uh, to them was encouragement because they could see in the uh, in the 40s that maybe the barges were on their way it would eventually be on their way out so uh, Coming up to the age of 14, you had to go into the yards to become an apprentice until you was 21. I had many an argument with my mother. My father had run off with his secretary, so my mother brought me up on her own. This was your adopted family? Yeah, my adopted mother. And uh, we lived in a little cottage, gas gas light and everything, no running water, uh, well, cold water only. And that was close to the river, was it? Uh, yes, very close, the cottages, they were rented cottages. And uh, next door but one was a, a retired barge skipper. And so I got to know them all. And uh, I would go down when there was a barge and they'd often pick me up and take me out onto the barge and I would soon pick up one or two things that yeah. they showed me and, and I, I'm a pretty quick learner in those days I suppose and uh, at mother was very very insistent that she wanted me to have a, uh, an apprenticeship career she wanted me to go in Everard's yard with uh, most of my school friends who were going as carpenters, shipwrights, blacksmiths, or sail makers, or riggers. Mm. That was still a trade then in those days. When the rigger, what exactly was the rigger? Well, a rigger the ropes and did all the wires. Oh, I see. Splicing yeah. and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And But they also filled in and did sail making when it was necessary. And uh, it's all very skilled jobs. And I wasn't going to have any of that. I was going to go and work on the barges, and she was dead against that, of course. But uh, I talked into Bob. He wanted. He was looking for a young mate. Bob Roberts. That yeah, was. Bob Roberts. And he took me away on Greenhive. And uh, I know that uh, the very first trip, we were bound for the London docks. I think we went into the Royals and we loaded wheat or barley or one of those cargoes. How did they load it? Was it in sacks or was it no, in no, no, just the whole hold? You went alongside the Canadian ships and brought it over and it was shot down a big, uh, from a hopper, sucked out of the ship down and directed in spouts down into the hold, in the main hold and then in the fore hold. The only thing we had to do was to get down into the into the cargo which was about came up to there and trim it under right under the combings so that when you did go to sea 
the barge was stable, mm. wouldn't turn turt or anything. And uh, quite a bit of smuggling going on in those days, of course. Quite a lot. What was the what was smuggled then? Smuggling food because we were all on ration books and everything. That was in the war. The war, yeah. And uh, we would load up two or three bags of wheat, corn, barley, whatever, sack it up, sail down as far as Green Heights. No engine, of course in these barges and we would anchor up or go on a buoy and wait till it was dark then we would get the heave the back the bags over into the dinghy and uh, scull them ashore and I would then get out the dinghy and run up the causeway and go round the back of the butcher Eddie G that's in Green Heights, yeah? Yeah. And uh, bang on his back door, he kept chickens and tell him we've got wheat, barley, corn, whatever. Anything he would need, yeah. For his chickens. And uh, therefore, out would come his little bike with a basket on the front and it would, they would come down the causeway and take, take it. In return, of course, we got uh, we got nice pieces of pork. And we got chops. So meat was hard to find. Oh yeah, very, in that time, very. Uh, unless you were particularly like some of the rich people who had mm. servants, one or two, the ship owners and people like that. Yeah. But they they didn't seem to go out and out anything. But. Uh, he said to me on this particular time, the only cooking I'd ever done was when I was in the scouts and I'd gone out to Swanscombe Woods doing twizzle sticks and things in the campfire. Uh, can you cook? I said, yeah, I'm all right. So he said, right, once we get down to Sea Reach, he said, you can, uh, uh, you can do the cooking. He said, peel some spuds, which I did, put them in the put them round in the, in the basting tray, put this lovely piece of pork in the middle of it and spiked it and lovely basted it with oil and stuck it in the yeah. forecastle oven which was attached to the fire, the coal fire, yeah. stoked up the coal fire so the oven was at well at baking away. He called me up on deck and we were shifting some gear about, setting some more sail. And about half an hour went by and you can imagine that 80 feet down there was the bow of the barge with, where you went down into the forecastle, which was my cabin, because he slept off down here. And there were only the two of you on board? Yeah. And... Uh, he shouted out, Christ, he said the barges are light. Smoke was coming out and disappearing. Smoke was coming out, not up the chimney, but coming out the forecastle hatch. And uh, he then uh, ran forward, put a stop on the wheel, a rope stopper on the wheel, ran forward, jumped over the main horse and the four horse jumped down into the forecastle, opened up the oven and the meat was all alight and he grabbed two pieces of cloth, climbed up the, climbed up the uh, companionway, smelling it and threw it straight over the side and it spat and spluttered and disappeared in the sea and uh, he started calling me all the silly little bastards under the sun it appears that day that uh, we had two drums of oil in the forecastle. One was cooking oil, and the other was, the other one was paraffin for for uh, filling our lamps, our lamps, our navigation lamps, 
and I used paraffin that day. Brilliant, brilliant cup. And, and uh, I think we ended up having corned beef for quite a few <laughs> days. But uh, I knew Bob for about another 30 years. Mm. And he never let me forget it. Every time we met and had a pint together or anything, he always he always reminded me. And you did the cooking after that as well? He let you carry yeah, on? Yeah, I carried on, but I got a bit better. I'm and then better. when you were sailing with Bob Roberts, then you had yeah. to, it was just the two of you, you just were his mate then? We, we used to go, we'd, we'd do that trip, we'd do that trip a few times, and we towed, we'd go into Yarmouth, Great Yarmouth, the tug would then tow us right up through the rivers, through the broads. And that tug was a, um, a motor tug, was motor. it? Yeah. It took us right the way up, small tug, took us right the way up to Norwich. And mm. we'd lay alongside Reed's Mill at Norwich. And uh, they would then, similar, but they'd suck it out, they'd suck it out. And right down to the last, and then of course in the corners, of the hold, I had to sweep it into mm. a pile so that they could they could suck it all up. Now, right, we've done that. What would your return cargo right, be? Doing. So, he, he might have got on he might have got on a, a phone from uh, from Reeds, and they would said to him, proceed to the River Humber. And go to Kidby. There was a coal mine at Kidby, and we went, and that was between Hull and Grimsby. And we sailed to, to Kidby, and we'd have open cast coal. That would be shot straight in. We'd pull the spreet and right over one side, and they'd shoot the coal in, all loose. Had a lot of Cleaning up to do oh, once you've yeah. got the and, coal and then uh, the grain. Right. Then we'd sail, we'd cover over, cover up everything, boards back on, canvas back on and everything. And we'd then go down, sail to Harwich Gasworks. We might unload the lot. But sometimes we unloaded only half. Then we still we proceed down to Margate Gasworks and empty the rest. Then back up to Kidby. We'd be doing that quite a few times. Now in that time, of course, we sailed day and night, wet and dry. Yeah, well, to get the tide, to catch the tides. Yeah. And so we, navigation lamps went up, of course, and we sailed and. Uh, these old skippers, they knew every every inch of the water where they were exactly. You know, a light flashing way a couple of three mile ahead, they knew exactly what was under them, where they could go and where they couldn't go. Amazing. And There's quite uh, treacherous waters out there, isn't it, on the sorry? sands? Quite treacherous oh, yeah, waters. Very. And then sometimes in the daytime we'd look up, we'd look up and he'd say, I think we're in for a bit of a hooli. I think we're going to have a blow. I think we'd better run for shelter. And we'd run into an inlet somewhere, maybe into one of the rivers, of River Stour or the River Blackwater. And we might anchor in there or, or the River Orwell. And uh, sure enough, uh, they were more or less right always. Over it came a huge thunderstorm blowing blowing up a gale and we might lay there a couple of days before we continued our journey. Did you go ashore then or would you have to stay on board? Sometimes, it depends how far we were in. He lived at Pin Mill in a cottage so if we were near in the River Orwell he did go ashore. And, and did his, his wife live in the... His wife in, was there. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was on uh, Green Hive. I was on Green Hive with him for nine months and she then, she being a steel barge, she holed her bottom, she got a small hole, a rivet and she was taking water. Incidentally, I must tell you that every time 
the coal was emptied, it was my job always to sweep the 80 feet hold down in great big piles of coal and coal dust, dust. the small bits, and we'd bag it up and we'd take that up as well and they'd take it ashore. Also, we'll always have plenty of coal for our coal bunker yeah. out of the cargo. But our next trip might be London docks again to load wheat. And I can assure you a lot of people uh, must have had uh, current bread <laughs> in, in their... Uh, in, in the bread that was made, because I didn't get every, I can assure no. you, I didn't get every bit of coal out. No, an impossible so, task. And I it went think. into the mill. Mm. Uh, 